do an introduction for everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I see a few people on Facebook Live, and I know that there's people here, and oh my gosh, 58 participants. Holy cow. Hello, everybody. Um, Sarah and I um, work at Mixed Staffing and Recruiting, and we wanted to be able to use our platform to share the voices of Black people in our community. Um, so for this next hour, you'll get the chance to hear from our five panelists. Um, we'll share a little bit about our stories and what and how we're feeling um, with everything going on in the country. And then at the end, we'll do a Q&A and offer up some next steps for you to do. Um, to start making a change with us. So um, we can just go ahead and let Jay begin and share a story. Good morning. Um, hope everybody's doing okay. Um, I want to actually start this journey around uh, what I felt when I seen the video of, of George Floyd. Um, my first thought was, um, wow, another black man has been killed at the hands of law enforcement. And so it brought back memories of for me of my cousin um who was who was killed in the muskegon county jail um and it also brought back memories of an encounter i had around 18 months ago uh with the south padre island police here in texas um i didn't listen to the audio um as i as 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 i was trying to take all of this stuff in i, I then i listened to the audio and when I listened to the audio and I heard this man say, hey, they gonna kill me. They're going to kill me. And the lack of response um, from that, the people around saying, let them breathe. Um, for me, it was really emotional at that time because again, I went back to uh, the incidents in which I would have been exposed to, you know, um, how it could have been different for me um, and I don't know why it was. Um, I went back to my cousin who, did he say those same things? Did he plead for his life in that instance in which he was killed? And so, and then I thought about the response or lack of response. And this has been the re lack of response in all of these instances. As we look at this, as we look at the officer and we look at the other officers and I'm thinking to myself, what are they thinking? What are they thinking as they're holding this man down and he's pleading for his life? And then it took me even back even further. You know, for me, I thought the, the other thing that came to my mind was, what did, my, what did my slave ancestors say as they were being beaten? Was this something similar? And was the look and was the response to their pleas something similar? And, and again, I became really emotional about it. Then I became upset. I became upset because then I'm thinking to myself, where are my white friends and family? Why are they not outraged? Why are they not saying, hey, this is wrong? And yeah, they did behind closed doors, but certainly not like us. And then I thought to myself, they haven't even charged these guys. So what's happening with that? And then the riot started. And I'm thinking to myself, the riot had already been within me. I was already rioting. I wasn't breaking any glass and stealing any clothes or anything like that. But I was definitely enraged to the point to where I wanted to smash the very thing that I felt perpetuated this. And again, it wasn't glass. It wasn't stealing clothes. It wasn't stealing, you know, breaking through stores. But, but there's something within America that needs to be broken and smashed, and it's racism. And that's how I felt when I saw the video of George Floyd. Thank you. And then did you want to talk a little bit about your experiences personally? What's that? Did you want to speak a little bit more on your experiences personally? All right. Thanks. I can't hear. Jay, thanks for sharing it. Obviously, I have technical difficulties a little bit here. Hey, um, awesome that we have 71 people watching, um, listening in. I think it's super important for people to hear. I think we'll transition. We're going to try. I was obviously having issues with uh, my computer, but we're going to try to 
keep each person, um, we're going to have a dialogue. Each person's going to talk about how they're feeling, what's going on in their life. Um, and then we're going to end with how um, they feel we as uh, a community can help bring about change in the world. So um, we're going to transition into Courtney. Um, Courtney uh, is one of our recruiters here at Mixed Staffing and a huge uh, impactor in the community. She has hired um, over 150 people who have been a part of the criminal justice system. 70% of those people were of color. Um, and so we'd love to hear your story, Courtney. Thank you. So hopefully you guys can hear me all right. And I have notes, as you can see, so I'm going to try to keep it <laughs> within eight minutes. But um, again, I'm Courtney, a recruiter with Make Staffing, and I'm a Calvin grad um, with a BSW. Um, so I just kind of want to start with, I'm sure everyone has seen the video um, that, or actually the commercial that Nickelodeon posted um, for eight minutes long saying that I can't breathe. And I remember a woman posting and going viral saying that she was frustrated and it was scaring her child. Um, and though her child was scared for eight minutes, sadly, this is where it starts um, for a lot of children. Um, I just think of like constantly in school being made fun of uh, for the way my hair looked, my nose, my lips, uh, features um, that are known for black people have been laughed at. Um, my dark-skinned brothers and sisters being called dirty um, because of the way that they looked and crying and trying to clean their skin, wondering why they don't look like their friends um, when in reality there was nothing wrong with the way that they looked. Um, I remember in fifth grade specifically, my teacher, um, we were singing a song about um, animals in the jungle in Africa. And I still remember it, and I will not sing it to bear all of your ears, um, but I still remember my fifth grade teacher stopping the music and scolding all the Black people who were not singing the song and saying like, you guys should be ashamed for not singing this song because it's of your people. And even in fifth grade, um, I remember feeling anger and frustration. Um, so though kids are scared, it, it starts that young, sadly. Um, I still remember in middle school um, being racially profiled, literally trying to walk to the mall. Um, an officer accused my friends and I of selling drugs and we were in middle school and it, it baffled me. And how does someone who's 13, 14 years old wrap their minds around someone coming up to them and accusing them of something that's so bold? Um, but I remember a lot of experiences where um, I just dealt with microaggressions in college, actually. Um, so I was hoping that by going to a Christian school and people who had similar beliefs and faith as mine, that I wouldn't have to deal with things like that. Um, and in a sense, it actually got um, a bit worse. Um, so. I did the Entrada Scholars Program, um, which was a program that um, helps um, build diversity and inclusion through Calvin. And I enjoyed the program thoroughly, but it definitely put me into culture shock when I got onto campus my freshman year. Um, I, my mom, when we went to do uh, the first day freshman orientation, she was like, Courtney, I just want to make sure that you don't feel uncomfortable being a little black jelly bean in the midst of all the pink ones. I don't know why she said pink, but that's literally how I felt, like a giant bowl of people that didn't look like me and there were just a few specks in there and I felt overwhelmed. Um, and a few of the instances that I remember um, were, um, we had unlearned week. Unlearned week was meant to, you know, educate the campus about social injustices and racism. And I'm like, wow, that is really inspiring and that's really progressive. Um, but then it got met with my fellow peers saying like, oh, here we go with I hate white people week. And I'm like, you didn't even go to any of the events that you were supposed to. I feel like people purposely stayed away from the harder conversations that need to be held and wanted to instead go to the drum circle. Um, so that automatically, it, it just showed me how 
a lot of the students weren't interested in being actively anti-racist, um, which was really hurt. And then it wasn't just the students, it was also my professors and the alumni. Um, I worked with the phone-a-thon calling alum trying to get money to come into the school. And I remember talking to a gentleman and he says, Courtney, you are, you've are just been so nice and so respectful. Um, you must be a young, blonde haired, blue eyed girl. And I was like, um, I'm not actually, um, I actually have dark hair. And he was like, well, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. And that's been a quote that I've heard so many times. And I don't think people realize how hurtful that can be to who they're speaking to. And he had no idea who he was speaking to on the phone. And he was like, so what does your hair look like? And I'm like, um, I'm like, I have a nice Afro puff. And he was like, oh, so you look like Michael Jackson. And I'm like, okay, this is time <laughs> for the call to end. And things like that, if people don't realize the hurt that comes from them and their microaggressions, their small things that nitpick and eat at you that some people hear as jokes, but when it's happening to you on a daily basis, it really does um, eat away at you. Um, but the, I think the hardest was um, the event that we called Snowmageddon, where an, actually a really good friend of mine was going outside to his car and in the snow, written on his car, um, was white power and the cars next to him were swastikas. And I don't think the person knew that they wrote on a person of color's car, um, but the pictures went viral and we knew that things needed to be done. And um, though we got a lot of people who were um, ashamed of that, we also got a lot of people saying that we were overreacting um, and that we couldn't take a joke, um, which I just, it shows how a lot of problems and issues in the black community, people don't see as serious. Cause there's some things that you don't joke about. You don't joke about sexual assault because it's heinous, it's wrong. You don't joke about the Holocaust, it's heinous, it's wrong. Um, there's a lot of things you don't joke about. And the fact that we talked about racism and they felt like it was a joke, it just shows how some people aren't saying this as something um, that's heinous and wrong. Um, and it's definitely things that have been ingrained in your mindset that need to change. Um, so I just think back to my history class and they were asking what time would you want to go back in time to? And I said, I wouldn't want to go back in time because I would have to experience slavery, racism, segregation. But then I think now seeing um, George Floyd, it's 2020, and I don't have to go back in time to experience these things. Um, and my time is up, but I, I just want people to know that though we see names, these these people could be the people that you see sitting on the panel right here. Um, Brianna Taylor went to my high school um, and it's, it's personal, it's getting personal. Um, it's not just a hashtag, um, it's the people um, in your community. All right, thanks, Courtney. Sorry, I didn't realize that that timer did that. That was awful. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> that was so heartfelt and so good. So thank you so much for speaking to that. Um, it was such powerful words and, and definitely something I think we all can learn from that. Um, so next up we've got is um, AJ and AJ uh, graduated from Western Michigan University. He started a nonprofit organization and also is a co-founder of the Midwest Tech Project. Um, all the work that uh, AJ does is often for the community, um, for people less fortunate, and just he is an advocate for people in general. So AJ, we look forward to hearing your story and thanks for being here. Uh, Sarah, uh, I'm only here because you invited me as I share. Um, for Black people during this time, uh, the trauma is real, it's relived, and sad, you know, sadly it's probably not going to be the last name. Uh, but I'd like to begin with just a couple resources that I think I'd like to share, which is um, to help continue to educate and open the eyes of our white brothers and sisters, which are 
Jane Elliott, the blue and brown eye experiment. I think that's super necessary. Uh, Tim Wise, he's uh, has a ton of, uh, he's a, a racial equity warrior as I'll frame him, but uh, he's super well known, but on YouTube, you can find a, con a ton of his content. Um, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander and White Fragility, uh, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism by Robin D'Angelo. And uh, just wanted to provide those resources because as a, a black man, there's, there's nothing that I feel that I can say to truly communicate uh, the hurt, the pain, despair, lived experience of our people, our, our elders, our ancestors. Um, so those people are a lot more uh, smarter than me. Uh, and then we, there's also um, authors who, who are white in there. And I feel that um, though, you know, those are some of the best teachers right now that can help explain uh, at least what racism feels like uh, and what we can do about it. So some of my experiences of, of working in government is really what I'll center my conversation around. And um, I, I have the same lived experiences as, as others on the panel, but I wanna talk about the active role that government plays in the, the trauma of my people. Uh, everyone knows slavery reconstruction and you know, redlining uh, the Tuskegee experiment, and that experiment uh, was a direct um, implementation of the United States Health Department to inject syphilis into African American males, just to see how it works. And um, if that type of experiment happened historically, uh, it, it concluded in the 70s, so that was only 50 years ago. Um, Jim Crow segregation, uh, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, uh, and throughout all of that, police brutality has been a constant thread that has, you know, woven throughout those eras. And now we are at the point in the United States where in 2020, we have senators debating an uh, anti-lynching bill. And um, uh, to me, it's tough to fathom, uh, you know, why that bill hasn't been passed some time ago. Um, but it shows me that even in a, a quote unquote post-racial society where we had a, a black president, uh, racism is, is still alive and well. And um, George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, um, the list goes on, are, are sadly um, victims of something that's been outside of our control uh, something that black people didn't ask for. Um, and the only way that things will improve similar to uh, the Civil Rights uh, Bill, Voting Rights Act, is if white brothers and sisters are just as pissed off as, uh, as black folks are about what's going on. Because, you know, unfortunately, you all take uh, and, sh and feel or, um, well, may feel that people are blaming you for things that you have not done. And uh, in the spirit of accountability, I think it's important that you as white people hold other white people accountable. So then you don't have to hear those things. And especially when it comes to police brutality as a black man, as a taxpayer, uh, I feel it's outright unjust that I have to pay tax dollars for excessive force claims. When those dollars could be repurposed for better community good whether it's workforce development, access to capital, um, but the police pension fund should be paying for their own excessive force claims. I shouldn't have to do that. Um, so I, you know, I don't have much more to add about that. I would gladly share any of my time with uh, other panelists, but um, for, you know, if it wasn't for Sarah to, you know, the spirit of, of me as a black man right now, uh, we're just tired, man. We're worn out. Uh, you know, it's it's things that, uh, as a 31 year old male, uh, I have two sons now, and uh, I have to create a better place for them. And uh, we need everybody who's just as uh, outright mad um, to get involved. Uh, so, Sarah, um, that's all I have. Thanks, AJ. Um, that was really powerful.
and super emotional. So definitely, if, if, if the people watching on, you know, we've got 74 people on this Zoom. It's like we've got another probably 50 to 100 on Facebook um, watching. So if people didn't hear that emotion um, in your voice, I just, I pray they did because that, that is so real. So thank you again for sharing that. Anytime for you, sir. And we're, we're hopefully going to be a part of the change that we see. Absolutely. Um, so the next person we're going to have speak um, is Malay. So Malay is a student um, I actually used to coach. And she is a, a student at AM University, a historically black college. Uh, she's always been a leader, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so we look forward to hearing your story, Malay. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Sarah. I really appreciate being a part of this. Um, I'm also a very emotional person, so I'm really gonna be fighting to keep my composure. Um, so I am 19 years old. <clears throat> I will be 20 next month. I, like she said, I attend Florida a and University, an historically black college. Um, in Tallahassee, Florida. I want to start by talking about my background. I grew up in elementary school going to a black, mostly black school. And <clears throat> there, um, growing, up, growing up as a child, I felt very accepted and um, I didn't really, I didn't really have a concept of racial problems in the world until I started going to uh, mostly white school, Christian high. I went there in seventh grade. Um, my mom wanted to give me a better education and she figured this would be the best way to go. Um, all I remember thinking about or remembering from going to Christian middle school is trying to find friends and I, all, I ended up with all black friends, no white friends at all. Um, and that's really weird now that I think about it, going to a mainly white school. Um, I still have those friends to this day. Going to Christian High, I just felt very out of place before I found those friends. Um, it seemed the black kids at Christian were very, they filled the, they filled the uh, stereotype of what most people think black people are. And I, um, they were outgoing, they talked a lot, they interrupted in class and I felt like they didn't set a good example for what, or they didn't show white people that black people weren't a stereotype. And when I came in, people were always looking at me different. I didn't talk much. Um, I talked very proper. Um, uh, And I, I grew up and children or other students would um, look at me and say, or they would come to me about maybe problems they had with black people. They felt comfortable about telling me because they knew I wouldn't give a reaction most black people would give. Um, I wouldn't get upset, mad and angry, loud. Um, I'm sorry. Um, It's, um, it's hard to um, kind of be looked at as an outlier in your own community for um, not fulfilling a stereotype and 
after going, um, I only went to Christian for the seventh grade. What's that? Let me look at some tissue. He yeah, just take a big breath, Malay. Okay, so um, I went to Christian only for the seventh grade, and then I left because my mom found another op better um, educational opportunity for me going to City High School, uh, City High Middle School, which was a um, school um, mainly known for being uh, having an international baccalaureate program. Um, this is higher than um, AP testing. So we were, we had a very rigorous course and um, uh, my mom just brought me some tissue because she's watching the live. Um, okay. okay, where was I? I went to City High Middle School in the eighth grade now. Uh, and this is another um, mostly white school. You got to tell your mom to mute you or mute herself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm um, uh, going to another um, mainly white school now. And when I start to find friends, I find the more, um, the, I start to find more black friends. I don't have any white friends still. Um, going to another mostly white school and these kids were exactly the same they were outgoing that you would you would hear them speaking all the time um m my people are very passionate and it it sometimes gets confused with anger and that's a problem that i uh really want to make known that passionate people when they get loud when they're having a discussion other people receive it as oh they're angry at me i have to defend myself when that's definitely not the case um uh, i feel like um white people have to um maybe uh yeah, just lost my train of thought um be more transparent and um, ask a black person, are you angry right now? Because I'm not saying all the time they aren't, their um, anger isn't um, expressed, but most of the time it is passion because of all the trauma that we have been through for generations. Um, after attending, after graduating from City High School in 2018, I decided to go to a historically black college to um, get closer to my culture. Um, there, all my friends were black. I, um, the white people were now a minority and it was something I was not used to um, since I went to elementary school. Um, I will say, once I start, so I had black teachers in elementary school, white teachers at Christian, white teachers at city, and then I have mostly white or well, black teachers in college. So I've had a lot of uh, different perspectives. Um, I wrote some notes so I wouldn't get lost. Um, Still going to college, I'm that person to go to when people have a question, they're not sure they want to ask a black person because of their reaction. And they know they'll get a safe reaction from me because I'm not, I'm not, um, I can't be loud, but I'm not, what's the word I'm looking for? Aggressive or I'm not aggressive or I don't, I don't. I take a time to just pause to listen to what you say before you, before I respond. 
um, very patient. Um, yeah, I have an example of uh, experience I just recently went through um, at my job. Um, I work in a mainly, what's my time up? We're gonna move on and then come back to you, but if you wanna finish up Malay, then we'll we'll come right back to you. Oh, this is the start might be a little long. So what's that? We can come back to me. All right, sure, you did such a good job. It was so powerful. And I think you can cry as hard and as long as you want. So thank you for sharing that. I think it was just so real. Um, cool. So next we are going to uh, have our last speaker and then um, move into kind of a bit of a dialogue um, of uh, what changes people can make. I, I think the people sitting at the table watching were listening. Um, the idea of we can't just talk about it anymore. Um, it, it, we do want to hear what we can have happen. So um, we're going to end with Jeremy and um, many people know Jeremy um, as, a, as an amazing person. Um, he's adopted in 1981, birthed by a white mom and a black dad. Um, I think he grew up with a strong faith. Like Courtney, he went to Calvin College. Like Malay, he went to Christian High. Uh, he's been an advocate for people, and, and I truly uh, think he's being impacted daily um, by what's happening. So, thanks, Jer. Can you hear me? There you go. Good. Okay. Um, I think, first of all, uh, I want to thank you, Sarah, for um, providing the platform for this um, uh, and mixed staffing also um, for being a part of this and for all the stuff that, that you guys are doing every day. Um, and everybody who's, uh, who's, who's on right now um, and listening. Uh, <laughs> It's tough, man. I mean, uh, you're giving us an opportunity to speak and make a voice is heard. So thank you. Um, these are steps in the right direction, I think, um, uh, to have everybody talking. Um, I think these are, these are the steps that we need to continue to take. Um, like Sarah said, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I was adopted into um, a, a very diverse family, I would say, um, uh, with two white parents growing up. It was a, a little bit different for me, um, but uh, I've definitely experienced a, uh, a lot of stuff as a person of color. Um, and I think anybody on this panel can probably say the same. I mean, um, you know, whether it be, I mean, the list goes on and on, but whether it be um, getting pulled over for no really particular reason uh, besides racial profiling or, um, uh, you know, I've been arrested because I, uh, police have thought I stole my vehicle that I owned. Um, uh, I've been followed around thrift stores, uh, make sure I didn't steal anything. I've been at the water cooler at work, uh, where I work in a uh, predominantly um, a white environment, and uh, there's been racially insensitive jokes that have been made. Um, the list goes on and on. I mean, it, it happens on a daily, daily basis. So um, the more I think about it, the more it really bothers me. Um, because 90% 90, 90 of the time, I sweep those things under the rug. Um, I deal with it because uh, I figure the people are just uninformed, uneducated. Uh, they're just bad people in general. And I know there's really good people out there. And I know there's really good, this isn't like a law enforcement thing. It's not, you know, there's really good law enforcement officers out there that are doing really good things. And I have friends that are doing that 
who I care deeply about. Um, but uh, I'm I'm starting to realize for myself that like I deal with these things because I figure, you know, these people are uninformed or whatever. Um, but I'm realizing that I'm by staying silent, I'm not only hurting uh, myself. Um, but I'm hurting, uh, you know, other people of color by not, by not standing up. It's been really tough, uh, lately. I've had a, a, a really, really rough week. I've been in a tough spot. Um, I think about, uh, activist Jesse Williams and how he said that the burden of the brutalized is not to comfort the bystander. That's not our job. And he's right. That being said, I find comfort in knowing myself that there's so many friends and family that I have um, out there of all different races um, who are not like me, who are not okay right now. And the fact that I have white friends and family members reaching out to me, telling me, that they're not doing okay, it gives me some kind of hope. So if, you, if you're one of those people and you're not okay, you shouldn't be. And it's okay to not be okay. Thank you, Jer. Um, Hold on. Okay. Look at that. You're, you're all right. Your words are super strong and powerful. Thanks. As black people, we harbor a lot of pain. Um, very early on. We learn that race is just not is not something that you can talk about with anybody. Uh, we find out that there's just certain people that just don't want to hear it. Uh, racism hurts, uh, but hurts even more when you refuse to acknowledge that it exists. If you're a person that's waiting for a black man or a black woman to share their experiences with you, you're gonna be waiting a long time. Speaking personally, I don't wanna come up as being too sensitive because that's the label that gets put on us. So I avoid those situations to appease the group of people that I'm with. The truth is, the majority of black people we encounter racism and we suppress those reactions and that pain because we don't want others to know that I'm hurting for fear that it might look like I'm the guy who is pulling the black card or is feeling bad for himself. And that's, that in itself is not okay. So, I didn't want to do this, <laughs> but like I said, I have been way too silent. So, Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Stephen Clark. LeBron McDonald, Tamir Rice, Eric Garden. We remember you. And we will be better for you.
things here. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> it's just uh, hard to get words out. That was super real and um, heartfelt and uh, heard. Um, all right, I, I, I so appreciate each of you guys sharing your stories um, and speaking up and educating. Like I said, that now there's 80 people listening. There's over a hundred people online. Like people are listening. They want to sit at the table. They want, we want to help change. So uh, this is, I, I think where we can start. I, I pray that it is. Um, I, I would like to have you guys, if we can, I know AJ had to get back to work. Um, but just in the same order, if, if each of you take one to two minutes and talk about the change you would want to see from our community in general and more specifically to white people that, that really need to just open up their eyes and, and see and hear the hurt that you feel and, and know that no, no person, no, no person, no child of God, no, we should never make any person feel less than amazing and, and a child of God. And, and so I, I would just like to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Jay, do you want to start? Um, man, y'all moved me. Uh, I think, um, I think Sarah, I think it first starts with a, a few things is that number one, um, silence is an action. You know, if you're being silent, you're not acting. And it's the same as being, um, it's the same as the perpetuation of the officer, in my opinion, you know, so I think we have to equate those things the same that if you're silent, you're just as guilty. Um, number two, I think that, um, to prevent from being silent is saying to acknowledge it doesn't necessarily mean I'm a part of it. And I think Jeremy said it right. I think a lot of times white people look at things and they say, well, I don't want to hear that because you're going to say that I'm a part of it. You know what I'm saying? And so just being able to acknowledge it doesn't mean that you're a part of it, but to be silent means you're the same as it. You know what I'm saying? I think that they have to correlate. I think also that um, we have to teach our kids what it is we have watched the protests we have watched with our kids um five and six and four and they have to be aware of the things that's going on in the world rather than shelter them um because one we have to prepare them and two we have to avoid the, the further behavior and i think those are steps that we can kind of we can we can take immediately it doesn't require any money. It doesn't require any huge resources. Um, it doesn't require any real change in the, it, 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 what it requires is a change in thinking. It, that's, what it, that's what it requires, a change in thinking around, hey, this is no longer acceptable. Um, and this is what we need to do going forward. Thanks, Dad. Um, I think that's very true. Um, and Courtney Malay, Jeremy, any of the time, I think to make this more of a dialogue, if you agree, and I can keep myself kind of out um, and, and then have you guys, you know, yeah, talk, and about, talk about what we need to do because we, we're here, we want to listen, we're a part of it. And yeah. Yeah, to hit on what has been spoken, um, one, I would say avoid the what if situations like Jeremy hit on. Um, I feel like a lot of times I'll voice out something that I've been discriminated against. They're like, well, what if it wasn't intentional? And it's always, what if it wasn't? Um, but what if it was? What are you going to do um, to get at that? It's like Jeremy said, it's like you kind of have to tell yourself as a Black person that it wasn't racist to keep yourself from going crazy because it's all the time. Um, also, it is Breonna Taylor's birthday today. Um, she is from Grand Rapids. Um, and like I said, I walk the halls with her and we'll post the resources where you're able to donate to her family um, to reopen that FBI investigation. 
Um, so then I don't end up being the next Brianna sleeping in my house and being shot at multiple times. Um, I also want to encourage you all to learn. Um, like Malay said, she's always the one that people go to to ask questions because um, they feel like they're gonna be more comfortable. But one, this is not gonna be comfortable. Um, and two, people are tired. I, I feel like I've always been that person too, that people wanna come and ask me questions, but sometimes you just get exhausted being you know, the dictionary of what it is to be anti-racist when there are plenty of resources that you can do the research yourself. And we will post those on Nick Stafford's website. Um, and lastly, to realize that racism is institutional. Um, it is infiltrated um, in employment, housing, politics. And as a qu quick example that I use, just Black people are more likely to be shown less high value housing and be pushed to segregated and low income areas. Uh, by doing that, they have worse schools, um, making it harder to get good jobs. Their communities have been torn down. Um, you see their streets are full of potholes, making it easier for them to have damage on their cars, meaning now they can't get to work. And your any business owners out there, your strict attendance policies, you don't realize how it's negatively impacting the black community. And is it intentional? No, not at all. But the fact that there's so many institutions that have been set up against the black community, it's creating a cycle. So you guys have to be willing to go out into those institutions and talk to your friends who are business owners or who have the ability to uplift the community and make change and stop that cycle. Thanks, Court. Um, Malay, Jeremy, what, what can we do? What change would you like to see um, happening other than asking if you're okay and yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say, um, I read this article and <clears throat> it said that we need more white accomplices dedicated to helping the people of color push the norms of American society, not just white people who are trying to um, become anti-racist, but join the movement. Um, also, um, when I was at the protest, people were wondering, well, there are good cops. Why are you mad at all the cops? Instead of police officers who think they're just letting us down at us, why don't you come outside and show your support? Why don't you show your compassion and, and empathize with and show that you care about our hurt? We're trying to make a difference in a lot of uh, reaction we got from the police was stares, saw a little laughs. Um, also, um, so treating uh, racism in a nice way and not talking about it is not how we're gonna get past it. So you could, in your positions at work, include um, minorities and the decisions that you're making. If you're in a room full of white people and you're discussing the outcomes of a black community, why isn't there a colored face in the room? Also, are you helping to include communities of colors and in investment service decisions that impact us directly? We live here, um, or whether collectively or individually or collectively, collective or individual uh, communities. Um, I feel like a lot of people in the world associate American with whiteness. And I, I'm big on structural racism, the way America was built. And I, I, I plan to study and um, dedicate my life's work to that in the future. Uh, also, I think more white people need to trust black people. 
I feel like a lot of white people are skeptical or um, they feel like they can't trust us. So that's another, that's the last point. Thanks, Malay. Uh, all right, we'll end with Jer and then it looks like we've got a couple of questions that are gonna, um, we'll, we'll touch on. Um, and so if you do have any questions for any of the speakers, um, we're gonna conclude with that after Jeremy speaks um, speaks to his feedback. Um, you can go to the questions if you want. Um, I would just say that uh, in closing, I, I know there's a lot of people hurting and uh, we need to lift each other up obviously first and foremost um, realize that this is not just a uh, police brutality situation which is what brought us here today um, it's a uh, um, it, 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 it's a race issue and um, um, we need to be conscientious of that and not not uh, not shy away from it not pretend that it doesn't exist because it does uh, and I think everybody here um, that's on and um, everybody that's listening and everybody that's participating I mean this is a huge this is a huge step uh, we just need to continue this and uh, um, just keep letting the dominoes fall really um, um, and uh, you know call people out when we see it and um, not be afraid, like me, to to speak up um, when you need to. And uh, I think um, that's the only way we're going to progress. So. Thanks, Chair. Um, okay, so it, it, I mean, the feedback we're hearing you guys is incredible. Um, I think you're really educating people, um, a lot of white people who um, need the conversation, who uh, have probably been sheltered and, and naive to knowing the hurt of, of loved ones around us. Um, yeah. Uh, so I just, I can't stress it enough to not stop speaking up and, and to those individuals that are, are flipping this on. Um, it being about violence or, or not violence, it being about riots and destruction. We need to make sure we stay strong on, it has to be about humanity. It has to be about black lives. It's not about, it, it's about, it, it's just so much deeper than, okay, yeah, we rioted. That's not, that sucks, but a person was murdered and several people were murdered. So that's why we're here. But Carrie uh, Link had a question, Jay, to you about educating, and, and I think everybody could speak to this. Um, Jay's comment about educating our children as a white parent uh, with white children, what do you suggest for my 15-year-olds to further understand? They have friends, many of them with race, many races and backgrounds, but how do I further educate them about those experiences of people sharing their stories such as yours? More specifically, outside of web resources, how do I connect with someone who might be willing to share the whole truth for understanding? I think the first step for kids um, is, and, and I know Carrie personally, but, but with, with, with kids, I think it's first exposing them to um, particular stories, specific stories, and then just simply um, asking them, how they feel about it and what will they do different and i don't think that that's different from from adults i think if you expose people to a specific incident and then you get their feeling on it and then you say well how what would you do differently i think then that becomes the change that we want to see or why would you do it this way you know what i'm saying and just ask people about their feelings about specific things i think the the the, um, the issue of racism gets so broad, it loses its definition specifically. And I think that we need to rein that back in and we should, and because that's what our kids talked about. We talked about specifically 
Martin Luther King, specifically George Floyd, not black people, and Kadir says browned it, but we say black people in general, we talk about specific things and the lessons that we can learn about those specific things and how they feel about those. Cool, thanks. Um, anybody else have anything else on, on that topic? I, I guess I would add to that um, being an, just being supportive. Um, I feel like a lot of times when people go into um, ways on how they're going to support the Black community, it's just an event like this. Um, but go listen to their music, go to a museum, learn their history, learn their art, um, learn their food, and, and like learn about the culture that lies behind it. Um, and, you know, just make sure that you're more exposed. People can be sheltered and not live in a diverse area, but that's when you have to be intentional about where you're going. And, and I, I got one more thing, Sarah, too. Um, the other thing that we, that we should avoid is that when we say, I don't see your Blackness, mm -hmm. I think that we have to be able to understand that there is a different set of experiences that comes along with that by acknowledging, by, by saying, hey man, I don't see your color. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, really, that's really discrediting or, mm -hmm. or really destroying my experiences that I, see, that I have. Mm -hmm. But when you say, hey man, I acknowledge your blackness, to, to, to me it says, okay, they can understand that my passion may be defined as anger. They can understand that my frust they can understand that my frustration in some cases may be justified. So I think that we have to be able to say we have to move past, hey, I don't see your color. No, I want you to see my color because there's an experience that you may not have with with your color. Very good. Yeah, that was super true and good to touch on. There's a question from somebody. It says uh they are an anonymous, an anonymous attendee. They want to thank you guys for your emotional work that you're putting in here. Um, the individual's question is, how do I reach people that don't admit that this is even an issue? I find that people around me are oftentimes saying, I don't have a racist bone in my body, but I know that they do because they were raised like me, which is to be colorblind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. I think um, I think for for most people and somebody else can chime in too. To to me, um, there are enough people that are willing to take up the fight alongside of us, rather than trying to trying to grab. We have to grab the people that's on the fence. So these hundred or so people, these 200 or so people that's watching this, Sarah, those are the people that we should be getting to and trying to align ourselves with and then allow the education and the experience to grow beyond. That's what I think. You know what I'm saying? And that's not to say we're going to leave some people behind, but sometimes we overlook, the, we overlook the people who are willing and ready to support but don't know how because we're trying to catch the people who are unwilling to support and be, and be on the other side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to, to add to that, um, as you're learning, share what you've learned. Um, for all of us on this panel here, dealing with racism is an everyday experience. So actively fighting against racism should be an everyday experience uh, for you guys. Um, and it, it starts with dinner talk tables at Thanksgiving. If you know that somebody said something hurtful, call it out. If you, if something, you know, irks your spirit and you don't feel comfortable with it, you have to have that confidence to speak up and speak out and be confident in knowing that what you're saying is true. Um, it's hard to uh, break down people that are hardened, um, but you might be the person who pushes them over the edge and, you know, provides a breakthrough for them. And don't be cheesy with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like don't go out and say, hey, I'm gonna go down to the, I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna make friends because they're black. So I can say, I can take that off of my list that I have a black friend. You know what I'm saying? Make a friend that, that, that happens to be black. You know what I'm saying? Don't go down and march and say, oh, I'm doing this because, 
this person is it no march for justice and 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 protest for the right things because actually when you think about when you uncover racism it's just wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's 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 just wrong it, it, jeremy said it it's police brutality and it's racism and both of them are just wrong mm -hmm. you know what i mean so you don't have to get on the side of a color get on the side of right mm -hmm. get on the side of righteousness and then the color the, the our differences in our cultures and our in our skin tone will fall in line. Cool. Thank you. All right. Last question here. And then I think any any additional questions that come up, what we will do is put them into next week's discussion um, and then carry over. If any person listening, um, obviously make sure to register for next week. We're going to do this for the next five weeks um, with the intention of uh, kind of what all of you spoke to is let's get together at the table. Jay, let's get these 200 people that are watching and listening and being willing to make change. Let's all come together as a diverse community and make change. Let's not talk about it and end it. Let's, let's actually be about it. Um, and so again, we're going to do this for the next five weeks. Uh, the initial goal was we'll have five new speakers every week. Um, I think that's what we will continue to do. However, if people have continuous questions and they want, you know, to keep hearing um, some people return or maybe they want a direct connection to each speaker, what my goal is, is to try to build that division um, and bond people to become closer together. Um, so a couple last minute things. So uh, we had some people that had said, uh, this session has really made me realize I might not be racist, but I am ignorant. Um, I don't know enough. I have done enough. It's really hard to admit. Um, 